I don't see that many people asleep. Some people are already kind of like figuring out where the pillow will go. <laughs> this is not the session to come to sleep, by the way. You might want to <laughs> go to <another. laughs> Yeah, this is not a nap like session, so I'm I'm wonder I'm warning you now. We have like four minutes. So you have four minutes to tell me what you want from this session. Don't tell me sleep. <laughs> Entertaining, that's, that's already a given. Uh, anything else? I get so nervous that I'm entertaining when I'm nervous. Why we should use the DQMH over a regular QMH? Why should you use a DQMH over a regular QMH? Because it's awesome? No. Um, <laughs> If you're looking for, if you're in a team or you plan someone else is going to be maintaining your code or you're going to be sharing your code with someone else, DQMH ensures that everybody's going to be having the same style because a lot of it is scripted. The other reason is it encourages, I'm not going to say force because I haven't figured out how to make LabVIEW kind of come out and be like, you have to implement the API tester, but it, it's pretty strong encouragement every time that you create an event. The API tester is the first thing that pops on your face that is like, do you know how you're going to test this? This means that if you pick up any project that anyone else did on DQMH, you know where to go. You know to go to the API tester to know how it works. You can run it, and then you can start using it. Where any other framework, you have to figure out what was the developer thinking? Should I go look the main? Should I look, look for the tester? On the DQMH project, you know where to go. Uh, anyone else who's using the like cover? Uh, the videos and documentation are just fantastic. I can I can hand it off to a, a customer and I say, if you need help, you don't have to call me. Go to YouTube and you know, there's tutorials that'll show you how to do it. You guys heard that in the back? <laughs> yeah. I spend a lot of time with those videos. So um, if I could hit, get from time to time a like on YouTube or a comment on the blog, so going on the forums and actually telling me that somebody's listening, that would be great. <laughs> because until I get to these events that I figure out, oh, actually, people are using it. I run out of ribbons. I have the ribbons for the VQMH, and I run out of them. Oh, sweet. <laughs> what else? Any other questions? And, and of course, during this presentation, you're going to learn about all other types of marvelous things. But any other expectations? No? All right. All right. So, last day of NI week. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming to the Software Engineering Process Architecture and Design track. Hopefully, you guys have enjoyed it. Um, if you have any feedback on the track, feel free to let me know, or Becky Linton know, or Nancy Henson. Uh, we want to improve it for next year. Um, I also wanted to mention the CLA Summit. Who here is a CLA? All right, so around half the room. Good news is it's September 12th, so you have plenty of time to get your CLA between now and then. Um, <laughs> I don't think Ghostet has plenty of time to grade it. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but I, in my opinion, having your CLA, one of the best reasons is to go to the summit and uh, sit down with your peers and with NIRD and see the presentations and present yourself. So if you are a CLA, we're still accepting submissions for this year's summit. And I would love to talk to anybody who's interested about putting a submission together. So let me know, let Stephen Loftus Mercer know, or uh, who else? You looking for full sessions or seven by seven? You, uh, whatever. Whatever you want, yeah, whatever you're interested in doing. If you want a 10 minute session, you tell them and they'll figure it out. Yeah. If you put one in on the uh, Google form, yep. you guys get back on that. So technically, the deadline is May 31st. Um, we do not have enough submissions to make that deadline be real. So, we only have a handful of submissions right now. Uh, we have a meeting on Tuesday next week, so we can, I'll ask Stephen um, and Jeremy if we should just start getting back people, because a few people have submitted already. Uh, we, don't, we don't like to turn people down, so we will do our best to make sure everybody who submits is able to present, whether it's in the 7x7 seven seven, or we just create a new format, like we did for the NI week, uh, to make sure everybody gets a chance. So, good question. Um, and I think it is time for Fabiola to take over. So here is Fabiola. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, perfect. So my name is Fabiola de la Cueva. Everybody calls me Fab. 
as in fabulous and modest, emphasis on the modest part. Uh, how many here have been to my presentations? All right, so the rest of you that didn't raise your hand, this is going to go very fast. When I get excited, I even go faster. Uh, we are recording, there's two cameras, so in one film we have the other one. And when I edit the videos, I'll put an arrow somewhere down here to go, and if you need to slow me down, you can do it on YouTube. You can go and say, okay, go two times as fast, if you dare, or go like, I want you to go 0.5 uh, fast. I do, all my demos are recorded, because I only uh, code in front of people when I'm teaching. Because when I'm teaching, I have the time to say, oh, I screwed up, you know, go take a break, I'll retake. But here, there's no do-overs, so I do a lot of videos. This also means that you guys can go watch them later. So I set up these bit.ly. Uh, right now, if you go to it, it's going to show nothing, but as soon as the presentation is over, thanks to the marvelous technology, it's going to hopefully, <laughs> go to a blog post that has all the material from this presentation, including links to the videos. This time, I did include videos with sound, so you don't have to wait until I edit the video for the presentation. I'll put the, once the, the, the NI Week rush is over, I'll edit the video, and you can see the video of this presentation. I see some people taking pictures. I'll show it again at the end, but, okay. All right. So, Delacour is a small consulting firm based in Austin, Texas. I started this about 11 years ago. We focus on working with teams that either are going from a one person to a team of people, and uh, they need you know, assistance on doing source code control, uh, architectures, etc. Or teams of people that realize that they're actually not just playing with wires, but they are actually doing software, and it's time to do good uh, programming practices. We have customers worldwide, and we also consult on hardware design. As far as our products, we have, of course, the DQMH. That one won product of the year in 2016. I heard somebody mentioning when we were getting settled in, it is a free product. Uh, we have the locking amplifier. And then there's these, um, these are only a sample of some of the products that we sell directly to our customers. There's a test sequencer, a configuration manager, some software engineering tools. Guess what they use as an underlying framework? Big image, yeah. All right. So what we are introducing this year is we started to notice that this thing took off uh, in ways that we did not expect. And we are a small consulting firm. We want to make sure that when you're going to a larger company and you say, I want to use DQMH, and they say, oh, but it's supported just by a small company in Austin. No, we are starting to have a network of trusted advisors. And we are calling it trusted advisors because part of that advising means even telling you if DQMH is the right solution for you. And we are encouraging them, some of them even have their own frameworks, to help you decide if it's DQMH or if you should go even with actor framework or maybe just stay with a simple Q measure handler or just stick to the state machine. Uh, their base, uh, wiring software is based in Australia. Studio Bot is in Canada, and Test System Solutions and Automated Software are in, um, in the US. So like I said, DQMH Toolkit is free. There's plenty of videos, like you said. Uh, you can find the videos on Bitly. Their documentation that ships with the product, that when you download it and just go help the documentation, includes embedded videos. So we try to have some text and then some video to help you out. I'm always looking for feedback on making it better for you guys to learn it. So, you know, send me an email, post on the forums if this documentation is not working for you. All right, agenda. The tips and tricks. I'm going to be giving you tips on how to plan for a new project, some implementation tips, and uh, some tips for API tester. Okay, when I teach courses for people that are getting ready to use the QMH, the first question is where do I start? So I figure I would share with you some of those tips that we use. And for doing this, we're going to take the continuous measurement and logging uh, sample project that ships with LabVIEW. How many of you know that sample project? All right, so a little bit more than half of the room. Now, if you, all you want is to do a simple data acquisition, that's all you need. You don't need the image. You can just go with the sample project. Uh, so you can leave that. Um, 
If what you want is to reuse in another project the code that you have on this project, or uh, one feedback that I get from the NIQM example project is that it's difficult to split among different team members because you're carrying that cluster of queue references among all the modules. So there's a lot of coupling, so it's harder to split the project. So if, you, if you're having problem with that, VQMH helps with that. Um, maybe you're here just because you want to learn, like Amber said yesterday, what this mythical VQMH thing is. Or if you just want more tips and tricks, then you can stay. All right, so seeing some of you guys are not familiar with, oh, and I didn't start my timer, John, so you're going to have to tell me when I start. You're five minutes, huh? My, my, I have, I need, I have <laughs> more five minutes. Ah, no, don't do that. What am I doing? This is a problem with the videos. We're going to do a quick tour of the continuous measurement and logging example. What do you mean you cannot play media? <laughs> Um, all right, so if you go to getting started, select the continuous measurement and logging example. It uses the NI QMH. I just like to do my icons, so I put a header there. And if there's a progress, you wish that would be as fast as when you do it at home. Uh, then create that main VI. And when you run it, you can start doing acquisition. It does simulate an acquisition of a sine wave. You have a little settings editor there that you can go to. And we're calling just my first log. That's where we are going to be saving our TDMS files. And we're changing to a square. So when we say start again, you get a square noise uh, signal. And then if, you, uh, if we go to explore and go to the folder where I save them, you get the TDMS file. If you have in Excel installed the TDMS uh, plugin, you can then just uh, look at them from there. So we're going to do a sine wave now. Start. So, and then we're done, right? Yeah, so we're going to go to Excel. So the Cortana, please open Excel. We go to Excel. We select the TDMS file. We have the two that we just recorded. And you can see there that the first one was the square with Gaussian nose, noise, and you have all the information you need. So again, if all you want to do is a simple data acquisition, go to this, you have your project, you have your message right there, your acquisition loop, your login loop, your display loop, everything is on the same block diet. All right? That was clear, right? So this is going to be the entire presentation is going to be at this phase. <laughs> All right. So the first tip is model your DQMH. Figure out what those bubbles are and what those arrows are. And this step is very important because you really want, it's easier to throw away a piece of napkin or paper or erase a whiteboard than it is to throw away code that you already invested in. So this is an example of a diagram, and I'm just saying a diagram, because there's not, never really the diagram for solving the continuous measurement and logging example. So we have a UI module, the DAT module, the log module, the settings editor. And then as far as the messages that we have, we have start acquiring, that updated, et cetera. Um, this next one has helped a lot the people that are just getting started. It's a little simple table where you put your module, what's the name of your request, what is the request arguments that you want to set, um, do you need a wait for reply? Start asking yourself, do I need it asynchronous or synchronous? What are going to be the reply arguments? If you have a broadcast associated with that request, you put it in that line. So if we were to fill it out for the continuous measurement and logging, yeah? So do you have a good, or a good recommendation for a starting point on the, on the modules? Like how do you, I mean, if you're just sitting down, again, picking up DQMH or module-based architecture for the first time, where, how, do you, how do you just start to define your modules? Do you have a good place to recommend? Uh, yeah, that one, let's see if we have time at the end. Sure. Because I can spend a lot of time trying to explain how to separate with which modules. I think, I think this first section is going to give you some tips. All right, so in our case, we are doing a UI module. You don't, if, you, if you have worked with the sample, um, with the project template that ships with LabVIEW, the, the, the top level application, not with LabVIEW, with DQMH, the top level application is a state machine. We did that to show you that uh, unlike After Framework, which is contagious, 
DQMH is not contagious. You can really limit it and call it from anywhere. But for this example, the UI itself is also a DQMH module. Why would I want to make a module that doesn't have any requests and broadcasts? Is I can use the API tester as a sniffer. So just the option of having a debugger that gets created is good enough for reason for me to make that module also a DQMH module. So we're saying, okay, for, we need a message to start acquiring, stop acquiring, no need for arguments. One thing that we have been starting to do more and more is anything that has to do with connection or starting something, we make it um, a request and wait for reply. Because if you're, not, if, if you're not connecting, then there's no need to keep sending requests. And then for the logger, we would have start login, stop login, and then our settings editor. Another modeling technique is to use sequence diagrams. So this one is the uh, diagram for the initialization sequence. And then this one is the one for the continuous acquisition. I got, when I was doing the dry run, somebody asked me, I've never seen a loop model that way. Well, if you go to web sequence diagrams and you try to, in, to show how to model a loop, that's what you get. So that's why I use that representation. But if you look uh, or read any UML uh, book, you'll see that that's how you're supposed to do it. All right, so before we start coding, did you guys notice any, anything smelly? Ah, you didn't know there were gonna be three questions. Did anybody notice something weird? Yeah, see, you need to be awake. <laughs> well, the little hint here. What we're doing is that that acquisition module is broadcasting that the data was updated. There's two modules that are registered for that broadcast. The UI module, so it can actually graph the data, and the logger module, so it can log the data. If you look at that section on the table, the logger has a start login and a stop login. Right? Okay. If you look at the sequence diagram, that one I went really fast, you wouldn't have seen it. Um, there's a little note on the left there that says that the UI needs to wait for the acquisition module to be initialized before it starts the logger module. Another tip there. So what we did is we created an unnecessary dependency. Now, if you are planning on always having a data acquisition logger combo, you're fine. But if you were planning on taking that logger module separate, now you can't. If you were planning on logging simulated data, data that was generated by a file, now you not really can exclude that, right? So we really need to have that data updated. We keep it as a broadcast because the UI needs it but we need to put instead a log data request. Okay? You see why? Yes? So we're gonna add an extra row here for log data. And it actually should have been something that we would have noticed when we started modeling because the objective, the responsibility, the goal of a logger module is to log data. So it should probably have a request to log data. Okay, so um, I have two demos for implementation. The first one is just showing how to add the DQMH module, and the second one, I actually recorded adding every single event and implementing it. I did not include the, that video because it required a lot of editing. So this is what I actually see if you guys are reading. In the blog, I'm putting a comment. If you want to see that video, you have to say it in the comments. So, all right. Let's see, can I start the play from here? Yes, there we go. So what we're doing is, this is a tip too. If you start with a blank project and you create a virtual folder that's called modules and another one that's called testers, when you go to the or DQMH add new module and you put your name, we're starting with the UI, and again, I like my icons. That also gives you a break for me, all right. So when you do that, because we have a folder that's called modules, the module goes there and the tester goes there. A lot of people don't know that little tip trick. So that's, uh, that's uh, something that the scripting tool does. So I'm going to add now the next module. So it's going to be the acquisition module. I give it its icon. There it goes. And so forth and so forth. We're just going to keep adding all the modules. Okay, so if you have never seen the QMH, this is part of the scripting tools that does the generation of the code automatically for you.
Yes? Where are you creating all the names? I mean, I saw you type log, but it said log. Uh, the names for the modules is yeah. when you are in that little pop-up. That's where you put it. Uh, now, the art of video means that I might have overlapped two different videos together, so I might have written something different than what I actually did. Hopefully not. But there's the tester, the modules, Bellacore, DQMH, add new module, and then on the top module name, I, I say, for example, CML and UI. So it was not here. Here is just the icon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bob, you need to wake up. <laughs> I know you're a professor, so I need to I need to avenge all your students. <laughs> all right, some implementation implementation tips. Any questions with planning? No. Good. All right, we are about to get up in the um, roller coaster here. Do any of you have chatting modules? What does a chatting module mean? It's a Fabiola DQMH module. No. Um, too many messages or going really fast. Yes, yes. So how do you solve that? Well, one way of solving it is to have multiple event uh, handling loops. If you're doing this, if you don't take anything away from this presentation, just please take this one. Do not fork. I have to be very careful how I say my English because sometimes it sounds like something else. Uh, the event registration wire. All right? Because if you do fork it, you're going to fork it, yeah. <laughs> so, tip two is use multiple event handling loops. Now, I know what you're going to say. Fabiola, you're not supposed to have more than one event structure in a block diagram. Is that true? No. What the help says is you should not be handling the same user event in two places on the same block diagram, which is different. <laughs> So this is a call from an actual customer. They are communicating with a media player. So I thought this was a good example because all of you are familiar with a media player. What we have there is on the loop in the middle, we are taking care of the version, the volume, things like that. And then on the one on the bottom, we are taking care of elapsed time. Elapsed time gets reported every second. And when you change the volume, when the end user is interacting with the media player and they're changing the volume, they're doing it pretty fast. So if I'm expecting to see the feedback of the volume changing fast and still get the messages from the every second, they cannot be on the same event structure. Does that make sense to everyone? This will be the, uh, similar to priority queues in uh, actual framework. So the way we handle that in DQMH is you just add an extra loop. And then when I say do not fork the wire, I'm meaning that, um, you see I have a registration per event structure. If you don't have an, a, a registration per event structure, then you might have um, missed some of your messages. Next issue, okay, go ahead. When you have multiple loops like that and you add a new message, which, when the script auto gener and auto adds a, the state message handling, which one does it add it to? It will add it to the one that's tagged as the event handling loop. So do you know how we have tags on each event structure? So we'll add it, it to the one. It also generates a state below, or the me message handling loop as well. Well, this is this is yeah, yeah this one is on the tester, but yeah, it would it would generate. You would have to manually. Sorry, you're gonna have to delete some of that magic code that we create for you and I then just, put it in a different one. I just didn't know if there was some more magic. No. There's, there's, I keep finding more magic in this. Yeah. Well, you know, you can always suggest more magic, and we'll see what we can do. Like, the, no, Luis is not here, but Luis would say, we'll just put a jar, and depending, if you send your request in a $100 uh, bill, we might be able to, to implement it sooner than later. Priority. Yeah, <laughs> if, if that's the priority queue. Priority there you go. Um, all right, next kind of issue that I've seen. Are you flushing your queue? And I actually think the NIQMH uh, continuous measurement login does that. That when you stop acquiring, they stop the acquisition and then they flush the queue because they have a bunch of acquiring messages in the queue. Has anybody seen that? Is anybody doing that? No, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, consider using helper loops instead. George Hunkel did a very nice blog post. He did it on his own blog and then I asked him uh, to also put it in the, the Lacor uh, blog. And 
what you can end up doing is just leaving the message handling loop just to do business logic, and then anything that has to do with device control, you do it in the helper loop. It does minimize a little bit the benefit of the scripting tools, um, but for things like acquisition and repetitive tasks, you really have to do it. Okay, so uh, what I have here, All right, so we have the self and queue into the acquire case. We put the acquire case there. <clears throat> that's the thing that's doing the acquisition. You know, the magic there. And then um, we self and queue to acquire again. So we grab the data, we do the data updated, and we run the code of the API tester. We see that as soon as I press a stop acquiring, stop, stop, please stop. It doesn't stop. So what happened there is the acquisition did not stop because we had a, a bunch of pending acquire messages. So the solution that a typical developer would do would be to flush the key. Actually, that's a good question. You said like a prior, like a, I think now you can, you can actually prioritize it. Yeah, you can do a priority event uh, that says, you know, send the stop right away. And then you could do a priority in queue that will send you directly to the acquire to the stop, and then that's when you need to flush the queue because it turns out that you have like 100 and something acquires that you have not processed. I believe that's technically a race condition because it could be covered by another acquire message that gets inserted in front of the... Yeah, and it is technically a race condition, exactly. If somebody else uh, sends an acquire, even though you made it the stop to be the very first, you might still get another acquire that gets in between. So definitely not a very good architecture. So use helper loops. So you have your nice uh, event handling, message handling, and then you add a helper loop. Okay, so we go to um, the public API there. We have on the request, uh, the uh, request that we created that's called wake up helper loop. And then we move it to a folder that's called private request and we give it the scope of private so nobody else can call it. It's just a request that we're using and we're using the scripting tools because it's uh, comfortable to do that. The wake up helper loop event, what it does, it changes the timeout to zero. So that means we're telling the helper loop to wake up here. And then on the timeout case, yes, yes, come on, come on. So we go to the timeout case, that's where we're doing the acquire. So we're actually now calling the hardware directly on the helper loop, doing the message for logging the data and the data updated, all on the timeout. And we are registered for the wake up loop, but we also registered for the stop acquiring. And as soon as we get the stop acquiring, we set the timeout to minus one. So the timeout is never gonna fire again until it wakes up, wakes up again. All right, so another misconception on event loops. But Fabiola, you're not supposed to rely on the timeout on the event structure for repetitive tasks. Why is it that we say that? The reason we have that guideline is if I was handling multiple things on that event structure, right? Anytime any of those events fire, the timeout resets. But look at what events I have on that event structure. Wake up, stop, timeout. Do I care if the start and the wake up reset the timer? No. No. So I can rely on the timeout for that repetitive task. Okay, if this is one of those where it becomes easier for experienced audio developers to say just don't do it, instead of explaining why. So you're actually going to, if you need, you need it to shut off a quiet. Uh huh. So, yes. So, so you can you can get your other messages. Yes. Right. Do you see the same thing? Okay. So, go ahead. Why another why a helper loop rather than just another DQMH module? Oh, because this module is the one in acquisition. So if I, so when do you, when, if you do another module that does acquisition, then why is the first acquisition for? Well, it's, I mean, it's, just, it's still just another module with the same three. I mean, it's But you still have the same problem where you are asking it to acquire, acquire, acquire uh, continuously. So it just, again, you have to make a list of all the things that we're gonna discuss at the end. Um, uninterrupted step sequence. So this is the one that I get a lot too. Uh, ask on the forums is what if I want to do a step one, step two, step three? The immediate e um, yearning, I don't know how to call it, 
the uh, instinct of the Lavi developer is to get an array of messages and queue the array of messages, and the queue message handler will enqueue the states. Yeah, and I see several of those. That's okay if you don't care of anything getting inserted between your steps. But if those sequence of steps have to be uninterrupted, then you should not be doing the enqueuing. So what we suggest is this crazy idea that we came up at uh, Delacour, which is, uh, and I went too far there. Oh, no, it's there. There we go. Sorry. Um, we came up with this crazy idea of putting a, mess, a state machine weeding a message handling loop state. Now, what is your God telling you? What's wrong with that? What would be the problem of putting a state machine within a message handling loop state? What if I want to stop a board, right? It becomes kind of like scary, right? It's like, no, 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 Fabiola, why are we even exploring this? All right, so we are here. We are creating our uh, calibrate. Let's say that our calibration requires multiple steps to happen, one after the other. We get our request there, we put our calibrate button. Everything is scripted, so the only thing that I need to add is the button that actually is going to execute that. And they had already put the calibrate case. So what's in a state machine? White loop uh, case structure and enumerator with all my states. I put my states, it starts at one, two, three, done. Uh, have a nice little chief register. This is the fastest state machine that you've ever seen. And then we make it into a sub BI. That's the key. And the thing is, we are registering for my stop, my abort, anything that you want to stop that calibration. And the state machine is actually implemented within the timeout case. So we are used to seeing the event structure within one of the cases. We are putting that upside down, and the event structure is now on the outside, and the state sequence changing is inside the timeout. So this guarantees that I have my step-by-step -step change, but I can also abort it by stopping the module or if I have a stop calibration request. <laughs> Does that make sense? I'm seeing some surprise looks. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm turning your world upside down. What's wow. up? Oh. <laughs> you're, you're just really choosing a default state if it times out with the inner state machine, aren't you? Because other states can still preempt. No, 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 because uh, your states are managed here by your enumerator, by your shift register. Yeah. All you're doing is your default action is to be a state machine. Yeah. And you can be interrupted anytime you're going to the next step by an abort, a stop, etc. If we were to do it, you could do it a traditional way too. But in the traditional way, you, become, you make your uh, state machine polling, and it has to go every time between steps to go check the event structure. This way, you don't have to do that. It just takes care of it. Is, is this the, the thing that has step one, step two, step three in it? Yeah. The enumerator has a start, a step one, a oh, step oh, two, okay, a step three. Okay. So, so, so that's your state machine. Yeah. Your state machine is inside the timeout. Time okay? All right, so just some, some uh, still pictures. So what we did is we went and put everything into SoBI. Our little SoBI has the message, uh, the state machine icon, and this is what it looks like. All right, any questions? How do you abort steps? So this is the reason why you would do it as a state machine. The question was, how do you abort one of the steps that is in progress? You are moving to a message handling loop, so you can reduce the action that is done in each step. So each of those steps cannot be interrupted. So for example, if you're doing, I need to calibrate, but I need to wait for five seconds to happen, you would have a state that is called, has time elapsed, has time elapsed, has time elapsed. And then you would be able to interrupt it. Okay? So you do, it, it allows you to be a lot more granular, but still ensure that all of those things happen within a section. Uh, this has been very useful with our uh, hardware, uh, senior hardware engineer in, in house, Luis, because he's really used with state machines. So when we did this, he was like, okay, that I can get. All right. All right. Another misconception. Oh, Fabiola, this DQMH thing sounds great, but it's for beginners. I, you know, I do object oriented programming, and your DQMH does not let me do object oriented programming. No. 
The idea we had with the DQMH was to make it more accessible for different levels of proficiency, but the advanced uh, or the people that are comfortable with object-oriented programming can still marry the two. So if you need to share common code among modules where each module might implement the, the code differently, or if you need a quick DQMH module to be launched by a class, oh, why would you need that? Okay. So, what we're going to say tip five, you can actually add DQMH, uh, classes to DQMH module. So one option would be adding a class to a DQMH module would be the developer test sequencer. The developer test sequencer, we have two versions of it. One uses the PTP sequencer and one doesn't use the PTP sequencer. But basically what it is, is you have a tree of tests and it loads them into a sub-panel as you're running them. And each test is the DQMH module. Okay? So one option to do sub-panels implementation is to say, I'm going to create a request that says insert into sub-panel. But I now need to create the same request for every new DQMH module that I create. All right. So we're going to look at the first one. So this is the test sequencer. So we're going to our test sequencer. We're putting the name of our project. We're deciding we're going to be putting it. So this is a project template. And then when we say I want to add a new DQMH module, because I inserted this, I no longer just have singleton and clonable. I have the option of doing a DTS module. And you saw that we have tons of templates there. Um, you start the module on your API tester. You can see that the test runs there. You can abort the test. It reports back if it passes or it fails. And I'm able to do all that with the API tester. And we have, within the template, a VI that says, execute test here. For the hardware engineer, that needs a little bit extra help. Um, so what we do is we one that actually starts the module, has the starting module, and then we have a request, I believe, that is the run test and wait, that is sending the request to run the test. Because we are having this class in all the DQMH modules, means that I can have an array of DQMH modules, even though the DQMH modules are no, no objects. Okay? I know that if you're doing pure object-oriented programming, you really don't need to do this. But again, we're talking about teams with different levels of proficiency. So if my team is comfortable already with DQMH, they can continue to use DQMH while the architect puts in place all they need to, uh, to do the loading of the, t of the, of the code. Okay? Uh, this is, so I know I went too fast in the video, so I did put still so you would see it. So when we say load test, we start the module, we do our synchronization, that's what is, is inside that method. The next method, shutdown, just stops the module. And then the, load, the run test just runs the request run test. And the run test and wait uh, is um, request and wait for reply. And that's how we do it. All right, any questions before I go to the next demo? Was this surprising? Kind of like, oh, it's all use, of course. No? Good. Are we going to explore it more? Those of you guys that are OO fans that were like, where is my OO, Fabiola? Are you happy with that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Okay, so now let's go and see the case where I have a serial class. So I have this simulated class. If you see, I have a serial port, and then I have my simulated port. And then I have my device, serial device, and my simulated serial device. So if I go and actually look at the code, the very simple test has its all class-based, is initializing the device, reading the information that I need, and disconnecting from the device. Very typical to what you would see in any uh, hardware abstraction layer. I have these little clonable module that when I run it, I get a, a port, um, an interactive panel for the simulated device. So I can write something, I get the message on the port, I can write what the response is, press the update port so I know the information is on the port. So when I say run, read and, and, and get the reply, I get it because it's already there. If I were to see the simulated port and look at the initialization, all I'm doing is starting the module getting all the information from the configuration and keeping it there so the module can have it. And the wait uh, for reply is showing the panel to make sure that the developer knows that it needs to interact with it. And, uh, and then the trick here is this has to wait forever because we have end user interaction with the front panel. All right. 
So that's, that's how you would do it. So what we did is inside the simulated DQMH, whenever we write something, we just display it on the front panel. And when we do the read from port, we have three states here. Update port, we just put it directly on the output. Um, the other one we have is simulate timeout, and we take the lovely error ring and actually put the visa timeout error. So in simulation, you can get the same error that you would get uh, if you were with the physical hardware, and we do the stop. So again, you know, advanced developers, you guys, that you probably have already your techniques that might involve less code, but this means I can go, hey, intern, I need a simulated device, right? I just need you to create a new DQMH module that is going to have a front panel and needs these requests and, and stuff. And then I'll just wrap it on a class, or I teach them how to wrap it on a class. So it makes it really fast. So when your customers are coming, we don't have time to implement simulation. Now you know you have a quick way of having a simulated panel. Good? And it's a lot faster to create, right? All right. Okay. And, um, so the class, wrap, uh, class wrapping a DQMH module. So in the previous one, the classes were completely hidden from the developer at the high level, right? It was all, they were working, they were creating the, their uh, tests on the, on the test, test sequencer directly as DQMH modules, where here the O is on your face, and we just happen to use the DQMH module as a quick way of having a simulated panel. It's not gonna work for every team, but it might work for several of you guys. Uh, this is the class hierarchy. I thought you might want to see some UML diagram. That's another way. So what I did here is I ran the GDS toolkit. It did reverse analysis. I did clean up a little bit because it had a lot more methods than you guys cared to see. <laughs> but you can see what we have there. So the init looks like that. The closed port is the one that's stopping the module. And the right to port has a, a request away for reply. Oh yeah, and then there's this trick about making sure that you make it wait forever, so you do have to remember to do that. Nope. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's, why is there a wait forever? Uh, wait it's forever. a request and wait for reply that is simulating writing to port. Yeah. Because we are waiting for the developer when they are um, debugging to be able to interact with it, I don't. I, ha, I mean, I've been really trying hard to read minds, but I haven't figured out how to do it. And Labio is even worse than me at that. <laughs> so that is a problem. Yeah, it is. And then the way it looks on the main BI again, a little bit uh, slower. We have three events that we can simulate. There's the um, stop module value change and um, the update port and the timeout. So these are the three cases just so you would have them. So one thing to also observe on this one, there's no while loop surrounding the event structure. This means that I'm getting to this case in the message handling loop and there are just three things that can keep me out. The timeout, uh, I mean the, which one did I say? The three things that kick, kick me out is the um, the timeout, the simulating the timeout, the update port, or the uh, stop module. All right. Any questions? <coughs> okay. I, I raise of hands who normally programs on OO. From you guys, uh, are you happy with these tips? Okay, I really would like to hear more. If you have others, other tips that I didn't show, just let me know. All right, okay. API testers. Who here is deleting their API testers? Nobody's gonna dare to say because I know I'm gonna eat you alive. All right, I, really guys, I don't know what else to do. These scripting tools are telling you, please, 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 add testing. Even if you don't understand why the hell we're forcing to do it, just try it. Believe me, you will be thankful when you're debugging. All right, uh, so one tip for the API tester. Minimize unscripted code on the API tester. Anything that you're having to write on code on the API tester, the developer consuming your API will have to write. All right, so the, one of the discussions I had with Derek Trepanier from the, when he did the MGI panels, by the way, he did a package MGI panels, you install it and it includes a DQMH template. 
And I was very uncomfortable, and some of the, some of the, the, the more experienced DQMH uh, developers that I know were kind of like, there's too much code, because you have to, to create the class before you send the request. And Derek's point is like he needs it to be more flexible. But our point is we want to minimize the amount of code that the uh, developer is creating. So it's not always going to be completely true, but just make sure that you're having that thought process. So API tester should be a simple example of how to use the API. Anything extra the developer does in the API tester, they're going to have to do on, the, on their calling code. So move as much code as possible to the main BI. Um, use API testers as application launchers. So what I have heard from people is like, oh, these API testers are awesome, but then when I build the executable, how do I include them on my executable so I can have my sniffer and debugging tool included? So what we do, this is another uh, example of something that we did within our uh, test sequencer, I believe. No, but oh, I'm, I'm going to do it. I copy the nodes from the test sequencer, and we implemented it to the continuous measurement and loading example. So what we did is we created a copy of the API tester. So we go to the test API tester, we move it. We copy only what we need, which is really all the code except for the error handling at the end. And then we paste it on this new uh, code that's going to be our launcher. And then th from there what we do is we need to make sure that we start the module at the beginning. That's something the API tester doesn't do. So we're going to the start case, a start module, and bring in every, all the code that we had in there. So we make sure we start it. We put our status on the wire. Uh, for the stop module, we just register to the new button that we created. We put our error terminal. Um, we change that the thing that stopped the module is actually this launcher. And we add an exit labbing, because this is going to be now our new top level BI. All right, we add this little node with a bookmark that says, when you build the final executable, make sure you change this to a true. And then you have your show panel, because otherwise, if the thing starts when you never tell it to show, you're not going to see it. So now we create our new build spec. We put that BI that we just created as our top level BI. We build. Again, you would love it to build that fast. You run the executable, and you have your API tester on the back. So all our first releases of applications always have that debugging turn on. When you're done debugging, you go to the exit case on your main BI. And now it's going to always exit, so you don't care if it's launched uh, outside or not. So you want to change that, and you want to change that for the exit case and for the panel close case. Right, so you need to remember to do that. And then you go to Bookmark Manager, and the Bookmark Manager has these bookmark that you, as a nice architect to your team, you are kind to yourself and your team, and you tell it what you need to change. So you need to make that top-level BI now run 100%, not let the end user minimize so it doesn't look in, uh, show in the taskbar. You build your executable, and if you go to the taskbar, you don't see it there. You only see the main BI, but the API tester is running. So you could add a configuration tag to turn it on and off, and it's now always part of your application. Okay, so I call this the second life of an API tester. Yes, Matthias? Oh, what I like to do is use common line arguments as well with a dash dash debug. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, Matthias has this really nice trick of using the command line, enable the command line, so you can you can run the executable, and if you say dash dash debug true, then it shows the API tester, and if you don't do that, then it doesn't show. So that way, you're not relying on a configuration, and your um, end user with initiative cannot launch it, right? Uh, well, uh, how did you do that? Um, Matthias, you want to say, is, I think it's a build spec uh, option, right? You're on the build spec, and one of the categories you select, I want to have command line uh, oh. stuff. And then as far as the argument, I don't remember from the top of my head. Node of the application class. If there's a property node on the application builder palette. Yeah, no, no, it's the application class of BI server. Oh, on BI server. You go to BI server, open application instance, and one of the properties is give me the command line arguments. <laughs> I learned something new. Matthias, you should have told me that before. <laughs> All right, so 
I, the video went really fast. Basically, is adding notes like this. So whether you guys are using DQMH or not, be kind to yourself, be kind to your team members. Leave notes like this that are going to help you remember what is it that you're supposed to do. If you win the lottery or get run over by a boss, uh, somebody else can take over. Yeah? So you're using this trick for the API test of the top level module or for all the we're using this trick for the top level API tester, for the top level module, for the DQMH UI. Um, we. The top level tester launching other I was going to say that. You can do. Uh, we have the same thing here. You can have the API tester. You know how the, really our UI didn't have much use for DQMH? You could add new requests that say, hey, launch the API tester or something else for adding that support. If you are doing test stand, then you can include your API tester with the distribution of test and, and have something on your test sequencer that enables the debugging and just launches all the API tester when your sequence, sequence uh, starts. Right? But you do need to make the changes that I added about starting the module as soon as the tester starts. Otherwise, you're not going to get the uh, connection. Right? Any other questions? Okay, I don't see much blood, so I don't think there's a lot of uh, brains floating, so. <laughs> All right, so this is the other note. Uh, of course, when we do the, the, the module did stop, we need to change that to true. That's in case something external to the API tester has stopped the module. You want to make sure that your executable stops. Why did you um, edit the code for the executable options instead of just using the conditional disable for those cases? That's a pretty good question. Actually, that's a better idea. See, I love these things because I learn new things. So a good alternative would be, instead of having the node, so please remember to do this, <laughs> you could just put a conditional diagram disable. So if you were in the runtime engine, you would turn it on and off. Uh, that's actually, a, that, this one here we should change. The one that changed the properties to transparent or not, that one needs to stay the way it is because that's what determines if you're debugging or not. But this particular flag, you're right. We should change it with a conditional diagram disable. Yeah, but this is for the final XEC. Yeah, it's, yeah. De define final. Well, yeah, that's true, too. Right. There's another option there. Um, the way it is when this is false, the API tester or the launcher can still restart your module. So you don't have to restart the executable. Because you can do stop and then start again. Once you make this true, you can no longer restart. You have to start the executable again. So when you're debugging, sometimes you want to remove all the loading of the beginning that does maybe loading sequences, um, uh, settings, configurations, configuration hardware. You don't have to wait for that. You can just say stop module start again. So that, that's the reason we have it there. Yeah. Conditional symbols. But conditional symbols could be a good option. It's like, am I on debug stay or not? How about having two launchers, one for the actual final build and one for debugging while you're Having two launchers, so right now you have uh, something that makes me very nervous, which is duplicated code. You have an API tester and you have a UI launcher. If you add yet another one, you're just adding the burden of maintenance. So i rather have the notes for myself of when I'm ready. I know that this is the code that I have been interacting with. Yeah? Any other questions? No? Okay. All right, the art of waiting. So request and wait for reply events taking too long. Is that one of your problems? Cannot stop the API tester in the middle of a wait for reply? Has that ever happened to you? To be honest, this really only happens when you're doing like tests on test stand or, or test sequencer or, or things that really like the calibration stuff that might take several minutes. So if you're not doing that, you might have never experienced this. Uh, but unfortunately, we have experienced it enough to be painful. So the suggestion is create separate request and wait for reply events handler loops. So we have already stated that it is OK to have multiple loops with event structures, multiple event structures on your log diagram, right? So what we're doing is we're going to use separate uh, event handlers. And this is your API tester, right? But we move the request and wait for reply to the bottom loop. One thing to remember. That's no good if you don't uncheck the log panel events. So the reason we're doing this is we have this beautiful thing in DQMH that says show block diagram. And then 
you have a request that made for reply that seems to be hung. So what is, what is it that you want to do? I want to open the block diagram. And you click on show block diagram. But your event case on the API tester is waiting for the wait for reply to reply. So you cannot do it. So this is one way to ensure that your show panel, high panel, and show block diagram still work. Now, in order for that to work, you need to upgrade to DKMH 4.0. Because DKMH 4.0 handles the show block diagram, show panel, high panel on the event handling loop instead of on the message handling loop. All right? Raise your hand if these tips were useful. Do better. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, I'm, I have been elect, uh, selected to be one of the presenters at GDEFCon. This is going to be an independent conference in the UK, 4 and 5th of September. I'm going to be going into probably more detail on what you were talking about. On, let's start from the beginning. How do I even separate what module should be? Uh, let's continue this discussion online on the forums. I really would like to see what are the barriers for entry from people so I can help you get over it. By the way, why is it that I do all this? I am way too passionate about LabVIEW. I don't know if you have noticed, but well, maybe a little. Uh, yeah, my relationship with LabVIEW is probably not healthy. Um, <laughs> working with my psychology, you know that. Um, but I want LabVIEW developers, programmers in the outside world to be recognized as programmers. And in order for us to be recognized as programmers, we need to be doing good software engineering practices. So I have made it my goal that I'm going to turn all the Lavia developers into good programmers. So that's why I do this, and I'm crazy. <laughs> There's a link again. Please take your survey. If you don't want to ever see me again, that's probably a good way to tell. And I please stop bringing this crazy woman. Um, all right. Any questions? We have time for questions, John? Yeah. Really? I did not run over time? Wow. That's the first people. Uh, all these uh, new examples that you've shown, uh, are they on your image uh, Which examples? Uh, the one that you talked about here. Uh, so the videos are definitely going to be on the blog. The continuous measurement and logging sample project. Again, I want to see how, how many people are here. So one, happen, one thing that happened this week, somebody stopped me on the, on the street, and they were like, are you Fabiola? Are you the lady from the videos? And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, and they were telling me, yeah, you know, we use DQMH. And he's in the room, so I'm not going to make him, I'm not going to point him out. But I asked, I've never seen you on the forums. And he's like, why would I go? You know, the documentation is there, the videos are there. So why would I go? So I'm really trying to make you guys be more <laughs> involved in the community. If you think that the continuous measurement and logging sample project that I show here would be beneficial for you guys, we can definitely include it as a sample project on the next version of the image. But it's not now. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. So all the tips and tricks that I show, except for the uh, media player, because the continuous me measurement and logging doesn't have a media player, are part of the continuous measurement and logging DQMH uh, sample project. So what I'm hearing is you do want the continuous measurement and logging sample project to be part of DQMH. Okay. We have one vote. Go to the forums or go to the blog and vote too. What suggestions would you have for someone who's trying to become confident with reusing DQMH modules in multiple projects? What suggestions do I have for people that want to become... Best practices. Best practices. The, the thing that I keep telling my team members is if you find yourself going to a previous project that you did on DQMH and doing save us, remember my lovely accent from Mexico that just doesn't want to leave me, that's going to tell you what are you doing. If you're already using it for a second time, there's going to be a third or fourth. So instead of just doing save us, removing what you need, and then starting from there, take an extra step in between and make it a project template. Same thing with the DQMH uh, modules. As soon as we had a second project that had a serial manager, we created a serial manager project um, module, a DQMH module template. So that way, yes, you're still repeating code, but you have a base that is a springboard for all your new projects. So instead of just reusing the DQMH module as is, I created as a template with what I think is going to be common for different applications. 
and then start from the template and not what is specific for that application. What if you have a couple of different modules that you want to use? You'd end up with a couple of different projects. Um, yeah, uh, so another option is you package them. Instead of, uh, you can either package them as PPLs, okay, plug for Matthias, you better stay for the end of the day. Matthias is presenting at the end of uh, today and he's gonna show all, all you ever wanted or not, didn't even know that you wanted to know about PPLs. And he's gonna show how to package a DQMH based project into PPLs. So you can either do that or package as package manager. And then you create these things. So for example, we have, I'm, I'm trying to think if we have any, Matthias, do you, have you seen any DQMH modules that we have packaged that we reuse? I'm trying to think. Also about the configuration editor. So the configuration editor, so we have a customer that has about 20 DQMH modules that are used within his application and there's multiple developers. So each DQMH module is built into a VIPM package. And everyone else who needs to communicate to that module installs the package and, and uses the install code. But I think what you have to do also is don't try to make your modules specific. So you need to take over need more specificity, maybe you need another more specific DQMH modules uh, so you can keep the uh, higher level DQMH module more generic and be able to reuse it for those projects. Yeah, so, so you, you package, you, pa you package the, um, there's two ways to package it. One is actually package the code that you're going to be using and the other one is packaging a DQMH template. So when you go and say add new DQMH module, you have singleton clonable and my super duper new DQMH template, right? This goes also for you guys that like OO. You might want to make your local data instead of a cluster, make it a, a, a class. You can create your own DQMH module template that already has that class in there. You, show, you saw on the test uh, sequencer, the wrapper class that did all the loading to panel, the run test, all of that was already part of the DQMH module template. So if you're gonna be packaging a springboard, do it as a DQMH module. If you are packaging reusable code, package it as a VIPM package or a PPL, and that's why you give others to use in their code. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Okay, raise your hand if, you, if this is the first time that you're seeing DQMH. Okay, are you guys gonna go explore it more? Yeah, what did you like? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> your enthusiasm. Yeah, my enthusiasm, all right, yeah. Uh, so you know this is a way of packaging me in your computer, is using some in DQMH, there you go. Do you guys have uh, like a GED license or anything on DQMH? Is there any restrictions on using it and uh, deployed or used code? So right now the license is free and you can package it in, in your executables. The only thing we ask is that in your about window or your documentation, you say that you're using the data for this image. And the information is on the license. But if you wanna give us money, you know, we'll be more than happy. Uh, there are some companies that cannot use code that is free, right? Because they are uh, afraid that there's not gonna be any, anyone to support it. So we are totally fine with selling uh, support contracts, and that's also why we started the trusted advisors, because now you can go tell your company, yes, Delacour is the company that does it, but there's these networks of companies that if we win the lottery, you can still go work with, or if we get run over by a boss, yeah, whichever happens first. <laughs> Any other questions? How do we become trusted partners? Uh, how do you, we, we really, we, we toy with the name a lot. The reason we say trusted advisors. No, how do and, we become? And yeah, but no partners, <laughs> because you said partners. So the reason we're using the word advisor is because this also includes telling you whether you should be using the image or not. You talk to me, and then we, we talk about what's needed. <laughs> now we need to review your code and make sure that you are following best practices, that you're about, you know about these tips, tips and tricks, things like that. Any other questions? No. Thank you and uh,